Hello there. Today we'll be talking about downloadable content for The Evil Within. As you've probably noticed, it's been a long time since we talked about this game. And now you may approximately understand how people felt when DLC came out. Especially when people who played it claimed that DLC explains every single detail from the main plot, or at least helps you to understand it better. And it's true, to some extent. All in all, there were three DLC parts released. The Assignment, The Consequence and The Executioner. I'll be talking about the first two parts, since The Executioner is another game mode where you play as Keeper and it doesn't add anything useful to the plot. The Evil Within was released in 2014 on October 14th. The first DLC, The Assignment, was released on the 10th of March 2015, five months later. The Consequence was released even later, on the 21st of April 2015. So even players who cared about the plot probably forgot about it. Before we start diving into the analysis, I would like to point out some things. First of all, it's completely fine if you loved this game. From my perspective, such videos are really good training for your brain and practice of consciousness. Since gaming is the most complicated media in terms of production, you may learn a lot of things. From writing to composition, from programming to color schemes. Sometimes, especially if you have a great gaming experience, you may feel that there is something wrong with the specific sequence, but you can't quite point your finger at it and form it into words. But in fact, when you start working on it, it brings consciousness into your real life. Besides, it helps you form your taste and distinct something bad from something good. Usually it doesn't come from nowhere, you listen to your own feelings, listen to other people and other reviewers, some patterns of thinking that usually go beyond your standard way of thinking. You start to get into creators' minds and try to understand what they were trying to tell you. In many sources of media and art, it may be useful to follow the presumption of mind. In other words, if something is here, then it must be here for some reason. Yes, sometimes it doesn't work and sometimes it shouldn't. But I don't see anything bad in trying to implement this method of thinking into your everyday life. And when Joseph Anderson releases a 4 hours long critique of The Witcher 3, and it's only the first part of it, it doesn't always mean that the game is so bad that it deserves such a review. No, it only means that he's gained enough consciousness to feel what he didn't like and formed it into words. This may be a good practice for you as well. Alright, let's get this out of the way. In some threads and reviews, you may find such information that DLC explains many aspects from the original game. And it's true, it really does give you some knowledge that actually was critical to know in the main game. But on the other hand, I can't really agree with it. Once again, spoiler alert for all who wanted to play this game, I'll be discussing every aspect of the game just like last time, so beware. The assignment and consequence form a story where the main protagonist is Julie Kidman. For those who may not remember, she's the one who had to be rescued several times, she almost killed Leslie, she almost killed Joseph, she almost killed Sebastian, so you should remember who Kidman is. In the main game, she gave us the impression that she had something to do with all this. Too many times she demonstrated awareness considering what's been happening around. That she clearly knows more than she shows. More than that, Sebastian didn't completely trust her. I'm glad you're both alright. It's odd though. Why would they catch you instead of just killing you? Maybe he didn't see me as a threat. He. And since our heroes were separated from each other most of the time, it may be interesting to know what she saw and look at the plot from her perspective. Some extremely important plot twists will be shown here and I have no idea why these plot twists and information were not shown to us in the main game. Although I spoiled some of them in the previous videos, it only proves that without certain pieces, the main plot was vague and indefinite. Let's start from the beginning. The assignment DLC meets us with the following note, apparently written by Marcelo Jimenez. They existed together, but each saw things in their own way. It was as if each patient's consciousness filled in the blanks, creating their own reality. Sounds mysterious and intriguing, and I I'm, I'm really sorry, but I have a problem with this sentence right from the beginning. I'll tell you this right away. I don't believe in this explanation slash interpretation. I cannot believe, but the game clearly wants me to believe it. It seems like a stretch. In short, this DLC literally exists only to try to plug up the holes from the main plot. 
I mean, you cannot do it like this. This sentence looks like attempts of J.K. Rowling to recreate or, let's say, reimagine and explain the facts of the universe she already created. Maybe. J.K. Rowling was a part of Shinji Mikami's team, I should check that out, it would explain a lot. Secondly, if you were Jimenez in the main game, what would be the first thing to tell to your potential saviors and people who are also motivated to get out of STEM? Well, I don't know, maybe something like, you know, you see reality differently, so don't trust what you see, even your partners. I would even understand if this note was written by the journalist we saw in the main game as a part of his investigation. This way this note would not look like 100% important, but could help you to understand what's been happening around and lead to some speculations. But no, this note was allegedly written by a man who was directly involved into STEM creation but who couldn't care less to share this indeed valuable information with us. Do you see the contradiction? It looks like, oh hey, we've used an extremely convenient plot device to justify this mess. It completely destroys what you approximately know about this universe, but at least our plot writers won't feel that dumb anymore. And the last thing is the form in which this information is presented. This sentence is not a line from an audio tape, not even a node for God's sake that exists in the world of the game. I mean. We have all these forms of narration, people talk to each other, we find tapes and notes. This sentence seems to exist elsewhere, externally. It's beyond my understanding why the note of a no name in the main game is more important than this information here. It looks like this note was added in the very last moment by developers, and instead of helping us to understand this universe better, it makes me ask even more questions. I'll be referring to this scene several times, but I decided to share my thoughts about this presentation right away. Do you stand with Mobius? I do. I made my choice. DLC starts from the same place where the main game started. Kidman wakes up near the ambulance car. And yeah, okay, maybe it explains why we're all separated right now. Because in the main game everyone fell together and it wasn't quite obvious why everyone just went their way. I mean, Sebastian woke up alone in the ambulance, so presumably he was the last to wake. But now we see Kidman, who also wakes up alone and sees no one around. In my opinion, the approach where everyone sees the reality in a different way may work when we're talking about powers and mysteries that are beyond our imagination. Like the game The Evil Within refers to quite a lot. But when you add science to this chemistry, in my mind, it should be explained more detailed. At least more than, this is the machine that links all our brains together and something happens. Once again, I'm not talking about explaining every single aspect here, but some details are clearly missing here. Kidman looks around and sees a blurry figure not far from her. And despite the crash, there's no blood around. No blood. Or anything. We hear Leslie, who tries to settle down. I still don't know whether the game wants to tell me something, or this is a bug, or this is done just for the sake of the atmosphere. And we meet Connolly for the first time. <laughs> Sorry, detectives. Gives a <laughs> uh, wait a second, didn't Sebastian kill him? Uh, we already know that if you die in STEM, you die in real life. Or maybe everyone sees their own reality and nothing of this matters. You see, that note from the beginning stands on the way of forming any kind of chronology and in any kind of sense. If everyone sees their own reality in STEM, including people, then everyone should see the same person differently. But if a person connected to STEM is seen differently, then in what case a person dies? Which version of this person should be killed in order to kill this person in real life? Hmm, it doesn't make any sense. This scene just probably happens before Sebastian killed him. If a living person is connected, we see the only version of him. Okay, that's fine, it makes sense and she crushes his head with a high heel and falls down. <laughs> and 
And I honestly don't understand why some games decide giving high heals in horrors is a good idea. More importantly, why characters decide to keep them? Have you ever worn high heels? I haven't. But I know that they're inconvenient and loud. This level looks like the first level from the main game. We're probably going to visit the same levels as Sebastian or maybe even unite with Joseph Oda. He was also absent most of the main game. Wait, wait, what? Leslie. Leslie Withers. I'm sorry? Kid, I need you focused. I need your attention. This is a serious matter. Everything we do is a serious matter. I'm ready. At first, I thought that it was a flashback, but I would say it's kinda a flash present. Because flashbacks are usually used to show something from the past while remaining in the present. But here in the world of Sam, this is like a recreated memory. I mean, it is presented as a memory that is experienced by Kidman right now. I'm ready. I'd like to think so, but conviction must be proven with action. As I was saying, your target is Leslie Withers. He's a patient at Beacon Mental Hospital. But he's something more. Simply put, we need him to run our STEM system. Without this asset, our research will mean nothing. I don't understand. We own Beacon. Why not just take him? Our relationship with his advisor, Marcelo Jimenez, has become rather strained. The boy is a leverage piece. Jimenez plans to activate a STEM prototype at Beacon without our permission. Obviously, that's unsuitable. Have no illusions. It will be dangerous. Come, take a walk. The nurses are waiting. So, the main game wants to tell me that corporation that can rewrite history, that has limitless power and money, is not able to take one boy from the hospital that belongs to them. Because they have some difficult relationships with his curator, Kimenez? What? If Jimenez activates the system, he'll be pulled in. Hopefully he doesn't. But as a precaution, we've prepared an infusion to prevent... contamination. Like a vaccine? To protect me? More accurately, to hide you. We develop staff, but there is a ghost in the system. Something we call Ruvik. It means to keep us out. This infusion should protect you to some extent. Why send me alone? You won't be alone. You'll be with your team from KPD. You'll get a call on the radio reporting an incident at Beacon. Everything will be arranged. But there are consequences of little value. In regards to your mission, they're expendable. Wait a second. Let me explain something to you. From the previous videos, I already mentioned about wireless stem. Some spoilers ahead, but I need to tell them to explain the motivation. Jimenez decided to work on this to prove Mobius that he's worthy of being in Mobius, and while he has Leslie, he can try to stabilize stem and enter it himself. At its current state, the system is unsustainable. Something Mobius will not approve of. This time, only I am to blame for this. Our new prototype and beacon is almost ready. When it is, I will start its conversion to the wireless system. Even if the original STEM experiments go awry, I will show my worth to Mobius with its next generation. He activated the system that caused massive murders. At least, it's what I thought. Then Sebastian, Kidman and Joseph were sent to investigate the case and got pulled into the machine. I mean, it happened pretty quickly and Mobius had only guesses that Jimenez was going to use it, no specific dates or timing. So, how does the administrator know at what time and date Jimenez was going to activate his wireless stem? And not only that. 
How did he know that exactly Sebastian was going to be sent to investigate? Because Kidman is his subordinate. Again, they don't even know the exact day this thing is going to happen. They even hope that Jimenez won't start this experiment at all. And if Mobius or the administrator doesn't know all this, this plan just doesn't make any sense. And another contradiction is that the administrator tells us that the relationships with Jimenez are quite complicated right now. So this is the main reason why he doesn't want to send Mobius agents to take Leslie. And then describes the whole plan to a Mobius agent. Yeah, Jimenez probably doesn't know all the agents. Wait a second, exactly, he doesn't know all the agents. Then what's the difference between Kidman and any other agent? Yes, they didn't know if valuable agents could survive in STEM, but Leslie now is in the real world, before all this STEM action. Why not just send a couple of more qualified agents undercover and take him? Well, it's been only 10 minutes and I'm already confused, but okay, maybe it'll turn out differently. The administrator tells us about a certain vaccine to hide us from Ruvik to some extent and continues. You'll get a call on the radio reporting an incident at Beacon. Everything will be arranged. Again, how the hell is it connected? We already found out that the Mobius doesn't quite know that the wireless prototype even works. In what universe is it better to kill dozens of people, risk the life of a wanted subject, attract the attention of police and other people, than sending a couple of agents to kidnap the goddamn boy? I see Mobius as dumb organization that doesn't know how to use their resources properly. Kidman receives the vaccine. Now I'd like to ask you some questions. Have you ever felt abandoned by the ones you trusted? And she wakes up. And we're in Mobius right now, apparently. Since all minds in STEM fuse together, this is again a recreated memory. And I love how irrelevant people are presented in this scene. They literally don't have faces and since Kidman can't remember all of them or probably didn't even pay attention, they are blurry and covered with smoke or something. This idea fits into the mechanism of memory and allows not to waste time, energy and money on animations of NPCs. The only problem here is that in the main game we didn't see anything like this. We could see either ghosts that represented reconstructed memories or zombies and real people connected to STEM. Why Sebastian didn't see anything like this? I mean, okay, maybe everyone sees the environment differently, but the principles of showing us the same thing should be, you know, the same. If you use ghosts as a representation of memories in the main game, then use the same ghosts here. If you use physical bodies to represent monsters and real people, then apply this principle here. But these guys are something in between for no reason. After some wandering, she meets this guy. And again, I don't understand what's happening. Help! No! Hey! Not the light! Not the light! Hold on, I'm gonna find a way in there. Now you should get the true understanding why representation of the same elements matters. If this is only a memory, why does she even care? If this is a memory, why doesn't Kidman understand what this guy is talking about? If it is a living man, what is he doing in STEM? Is he also connected? If he is connected, why is his face blurry and covered with smoke? The only thing why he is needed here is to present a monster. No! And show that it eats. Although it could be performed through any random zombie on the level. And this exact thing happens literally five minutes later. It means that this controversial scene could be deleted completely and the game would be better. While trying to save that no name for no goddamn reason, the game shows us some new mechanics. First of all, this DLC is rather dark, so it gives us the flashlight and shows us those huge air shafts you can literally live in. And going slightly forward, the game shows us how to use cover. 
You've probably noticed that the game changed its course and instead of shooting, utilizes a more stealthy approach. From now on, we need to rely more on using covers, luring enemies, stealth attacks and silent movements on high heels. To tell you the truth, I'm speechless that such elements of gameplay were missing in the main game. I mean, yeah, there is not much stealth there besides some levels, but it could work for shooting as well. It improves the overall experience, although unlike Seb, Kidman won't have a chance to upgrade her abilities in any way. In general, Kidman has less health, but it still recovers just like Sebastian's. Kidman has no weapon and sprints the same distance as Sebastian. This stamina meter sucks in itself, but it's funny to point out that a fit detective like Sebastian can run the same distance as a woman on high heels. And wait a second, is that a puzzle? Wow. This, this is really cool aspect they decided to add. Just like an old survival horror. Wait a f This? This? There are nine buttons with four fingerprints of different intensity? This could be something interesting, but no, we have puzzles like this one. The code is written on the wall 10 meters away from you, the code is written on the painting 5 meters away from you, and I, I don't remember, something else. I don't know, it's, it's, it's boring just to talk about it, honestly. And the reward for this is a piece of paper. <sighs> this game is 18 plus, guys. There are a couple of new mechanics left. Probably the most interesting one is the ability to distract zombies with a phone call. You can pick up a phone and call the other phone. Not only can you distract a zombie, but also close it in the room. This is amazing. Maybe sometime later we'll be able to make zombies play off one against the other. Maybe we'll be able to find a smartphone and manipulate them from a distance. You'll use this mechanic only once more. I, I don't know what to say here. Wasted. Yeah, that's the perfect word for it. Already mentioned air shafts, by the way, can be also used to cover from any kind of danger. You're invulnerable while you're inside. And to be fair, this is something that used to be quite common in many games. It's great that nowadays developers understand that it's not a really good decision from perspective of game design to give players a chance to avoid any danger and remain untouchable by enemies for an infinite period of time. We'll talk about this monster slightly later, but for now you should know that it is able to spawn doors in specific places. Places with Mobius signs, to be specific. I'm not sure how this works, but whatever. I have a strong feeling that Sebastian was supposed to be able to do something like this in the main game, but it was taken away from him. We try to repeat the same trick with our flashlight and it actually works. We see the aquarium from the first part and Kidman in it. What, what is this? What, what, what is happening and what exactly have we seen right now? Is this... future? I can't tell right now. After some wandering, solving puzzles and finding tapes, we stumble upon some memories. And they are presented just like they were presented in the original game. Here Jimenez presents STEM and describes how it works to the administrator. And it seems like Mobius thinks that Jimenez is in charge of creating STEM, although the main creator is Rubik. Mobius wants Rubik to take part in the creation of STEM as well. Kidman sees Sebastian and Joseph but can't reach them. The system doesn't recognize Kidman's biometry. To pass this level, we have to enter Kidman's biometrics. Agent steps. Terminated. Please contact biometrics for reauthentication. It's a little bit funny to look at the world where minds are combined and even in this world, there are locks with biometrics. And not only doors, but also terminals and cards that are able to save our data and use it to open the door. Not far from here, we'll be able to meet a new type of enemies. Cadaver. It's Latin for corpse. In the official art book, they are called bridges, and they were supposed to be enemies that would rise up if you don't burn them. In this case, developers would have to add a mechanic to carry corpses to pile them up and burn, or give a chance to carry more than 5 matches right from the beginning. Let's look at the scene and try to analyze it. Kidman uses the biometry model and can't move until the procedure is complete. At this moment, a cadaver appears. 
but it's not attacking. And another one makes some noise in the next room, and the first one reacts to it, lights up and runs away. Apparently it's sensitive to the sound, then the biometry model yells that the procedure is complete. But cadavers completely ignore this fact. I don't know how to describe it, but it just feels wrong. It would be better if the model yelled at us only at the end of the procedure and cadavers reacted to that sound. Kidman would run away, but cadavers were still standing next to the model, meaning that they react to the sound. Same scene, same result, different performance without any kind of dissonance. Just in case you didn't understand that these monsters react to sounds, Kidman will tell it to you. And from now on you have motivation to play even safer, because now cadavers are after you too. Well, not really after. They mostly patrol their areas and just like in many other games you have to learn the timing to stay safe. We finish our biometry tests and move on. After gathering some notes and solving some puzzles, Kidman finds herself in this room with an elevator. Electricity has shut down, so we have to wait until the power is restored. And I hate this segment here. Let me explain to you why. There are a lot of servers in the room we can hide behind. Hide from who? Shade, who appears again and tries to find us. We'll talk about her slightly later, but the things that you should know about her is that she insta-kills you if she catches you. And the second thing is that Kidman dramatically slows down when Shade sees her. And taking into account the amount of stamina in this game, it means that if she sees you, it means you'll die in 80% of cases. And I cannot describe enough how I hate this decision. It looks so artificial. I mean, when she points her light at you, even at your back, you'll be slowed down. I would definitely prefer if she was made simply faster if she saw you. At least it wouldn't look so artificial. And the second thing I don't like about this level is the room itself. Let's remember what creates a good stealth experience. First of all, information. You know where the enemy is and the enemy doesn't know where you are. But in this case you don't know where Shade is because camera sucks and those servers are tall. And besides that, after some time electricity on the floor turns on. And not only does it damage you, it also slows you down. Can you somehow trick her into stepping into electricity? No! Does it damage her? No! Does it slow her down? No! Besides, her animations can be extremely unpredictable sometimes. What would it cost to add some cadavers, add some bottles for distraction, I, I don't know, something. Let's talk about Shade a little. In general, I really love her design. At first she was supposed to be the light man. It was supposed to be like a manifestation of the lighthouse in Beacon Hospital. But with time this idea was rejected and replaced with this one. Let's take a look at her. She's trying to find Leslie, she wears white clothes, Uses light to open doors and spawn objects. She's wearing high heels. Wait a minute. Don't you think that there are too many similarities? I haven't found any official information that this monster is somehow connected to Kidman, although it is obviously supposed to be. I mean, the design was clearly made to reflect Kidman and represent her in STEM, but if it were confirmed officially, I would have some questions like why Sebastian didn't see his representation in STEM or any other person connected to STEM. Besides, I've always thought that all monsters were somehow connected to Ruvik. Keeper attempts to keep his secrets, trauma rejection of religion. According to model viewer, Shade is Ruvik's desire to find Leslie, but it seems so stretched, I cannot truly believe that it was the first intention. Finally, we pass this segment and move on. We see Sebastian and Joseph through the glass wall, although I don't remember them visiting this location. Okay, let's pretend for a second that I believe the note from the beginning and everyone sees reality in their own way. And then, what the hell, Rubik? I thought that the vaccine from the beginning was supposed to hide me from Rubik. But there he is. Well, maybe it will protect me from his magic or something. Don't kid yourself. You're just as expendable as your partners are. As I was. After all I did for them. <laughs> we'll see how loyal you are when you know the truth. At that moment my brain just flew away from my head. 
I mean, from many reviews and many people I read and heard that this DLC is supposed to answer questions. How can anyone claim that with this scene in it? I already explained my position that there cannot be several interpretations of one person in STEM. But in this scene, Kidman was talking to Rubik and then appeared in the aquarium from the main game? I'm not even talking about the vaccine that doesn't give a shit about Rubik and his powers. But okay, maybe it was designed for something else and the administrator is, what a surprise, evil. Yeah, in the main game the plot was a mess with dozens of unanswered questions, but at the very least I could be relatively sure that when our characters met, helped each other, talked to each other, escaped together, they were, you know, together. And they interacted that the things that happened to them actually happened. And this is not the only contradictive scene in this game. This one single scene devaluates all actions of our heroes, all plot and everything we've learned after 18 hours of playing this goddamn game. Because now every single detail and every piece of information is assumed as maybe something happened, maybe not. I saw Kidman in the aquarium and she was talking to us. She was in the aquarium. And now the game wants to tell me that there was no Kidman there. That Seb and Joseph were fighting with zombies with infinite dynamite for no reason, but in the very end, Kidman appeared. I don't know how to interpret it. If you know the answer, I would really glad to find out what's been happening here. Remember when we saved Kidman from zombies in the main game? It didn't happen. Literally, the game wants to tell me this. Kidman wasn't there when Sebastian was saving her. She was doing completely other stuff. Then Dissolve Cut happens and she finds herself near Sebastian, behaving as if she knows that Sebastian saved her and she wasn't somewhere else. If you hadn't come along... Save it for later. There are probably more of them around. <sighs> without any explanations, without any hints, it just happens. And it destroys any kind of care for these people, even though this care was not that strong right from the start. Because now, what's the point of feeling anything for these characters, when every transition and plot element has a chance to be not real? Alright, let's move on. In the next scene, the game shows us the invisible enemies, but it's easier for Kidman to detect them, at least. If you point your flashlight at them that zombies completely ignore for some reason, you'll be able to see them. And since we don't have a gun, we can, just like in the main game, pick axes and kill zombies with them. Then, once again, the floor disappears and one of the most hilarious scenes appears. Just, just look at this setup. Kidman is pressed down with stones and it just happened that Shade was in the same room. And it just happened that instead of jumping onto Kidman and killing her, Shade decided to spawn enemies with her light. And it just happened that Kidman found a gun with infinite ammo and it just happened that she ran out of ammo right after the shooting segment. Oh my god. <laughs> I don't know, this this is funny. Kidman goes forward and stumbles upon this trap. And I still don't know how it works. There is no lever or button to make it work. You have to stand on it for several seconds and wait until it activates once. I mean, it doesn't recharge. You can use this trap only once. So the best way to catch a zombie in it is to stand there for several seconds, pray that zombie won't kill you while you're standing, run away, and if zombie decides to stand on the strap, it will die. Probably you can throw a bottle at the zombie to stun him for several seconds, but it's not like there are too many bottles in this game. The following scene exists only to remind us that Joseph exists. Considering everything we know, I'm not even sure anymore, by the way. From time to time, the administrator shows up from nowhere to give us instructions. At first, I was curious how that was possible because the administrator was in the real world. Uh, he was not connected to STEM, although he was there at least once, because he has a scar that appears after you visit STEM. Like a mark, apparently. The only thing you need to know for now is that the administrator is not real, and later there will be certain markers to prove it. This way or another, he orders Kidman to kill Joseph. But there are more important problems. 
that detective. Joseph isn't something to worry about. He doesn't suspect anything. He's expendable. How else do you want me to say it? Remove him. That's an order. What are you doing? Killing Joseph? That's not gonna help me find Leslie. He can't be trusted. He'll turn on you. They all will, once they know what you're after. We told you. You're weak, kid. I'm not sure why, because Joseph doesn't pose any threat. The game hasn't shown us that he knows something he shouldn't. He doesn't know about Kidman's role in all this, he doesn't know about Mobius. He probably doesn't even know what Leslie is doing here. And again, she was talking to the administrator in a completely different place. And maybe it would make sense if it was the real administrator, but he's not. Already familiar sound and waves attack our heroes again, but now Kidman is not affected by it for some reason. Although we already know that Rubik was able to control her in STEM. We already saw this moment in the main game when Sap was dragged through the floor by skinny hands. Here's the same cutscene from the perspective of Kidman. I know who you are. I'm not going to let you take him. You should have followed your orders, kid. Okay, why is he saying that? He cannot have any information about the order that was given to us by the administrator. Maybe he's possessed by Rubik now and Rubik has this information. Okay, but why is he trying to interfere and stop us? For those who forgot, Rubik wants Leslie to leave STEM. Yes, maybe it takes some time to write his personality onto him, but still, his final goal is to lead Leslie to a certain room in the end of the game and get out. So what's the point of trying to stop Kidman? Besides doing it through Joseph, when he can simply appear in front of her and teleport her into a wall. And this whole arena is ridiculous. There are some lights we can turn on, a movie projector to distract Joseph and one audio tape on the level. The goal of this level is to hit Joseph with an axe three freaking times. I mean, Joseph is still human, although he might be possessed. And all those elements of distraction are not really useful. You can easily pass this segment without knowing anything about those lights or anything else. Because in most cases you have to show yourself to Joseph to activate the trap. Look at the situation this way. You may either be slightly more patient and hit Joseph, or you can risk luring him to you, revealing yourself, catching a bullet and only then stunning him to make a hit. Doesn't it sound a bit more complicated to achieve the same result? I mean, yeah, I, I appreciate different options here, but the problem is that when you give options, these options must be more or less equivalent in terms of time, effort and reward. If the reward and result are the same, why would I waste my time artificially overcomplicating my walkthrough, especially in the game like The Evil Within? At this point, I think that we killed Joseph. Another transition happens and Kidman finds herself near Saddle Hill Church. You may remember this symbol. This is the symbol of the cult her parents were a part of. Besides, not only did Victoriano family live there, but Julie lived there too. And this is a great surprise actually. This is indeed a great chance to get closer to the character, because in the original game we definitely lacked some character development. And now this level has a great potential to be something interesting. Maybe we'll see some flashbacks or evidence when she was little, when she was a lonely and traumatized child. And indeed, we find some notes about her parents and how they neglected her. Poor thing. Please tell me about your family. Next subject. No. We've prolonged this talk for a while now. It's important for our understanding of you. They never gave a shit. Too caught up in that church of theirs. More like a cult. It was like a punishment. Nothing I ever did was good enough for them. They abused you? No. It was more like neglect. That's why when I just left, they didn't care. They never came looking, they just gave up. At night, I would stare up at the statue lit up in the center of town. It looked like it was crying for all the wasted life in that place. I, I want to know more. I think I start to sympathize. Wait, that's all? That's it? I, I cannot believe it. Can you imagine the potential of this level? 
Can you imagine the number of possibilities Ruby could do to her and what kaleidoscope of traumatizing events and memories we could witness? Why do you use the place she wanted to be as far as she could from? The place she ran away from? The place where she was not loved and not develop or use this concept in any possible case? This could be a random lab just like from the beginning with the same notes and nothing would change. Anyway, Kidman tries to catch up to Leslie and meets some zombies on her way. The only way here is that from now on we see how cadavers work and it's hilarious. Because they explode only several seconds after they notice you. I mean they're barely trying to catch you. They're rather slow. They literally don't pose any threat. We find Leslie and decide to go to the church not far from them. And now let's pause this godlike gameplay for a minute and remember the main goal of Rubik. What is his motivation? He wants to leave STEM. What does he need to achieve it? He needs Leslie. He needs to devour Leslie and leave STEM inside him. Rubik knows about Kidman, her mission and the administrator. Even if Rubik needs some time to marinate Leslie, I cannot say for sure the game doesn't help me with it. The best solution to achieve his goal is to either let Kidman continue her mission or keep Kidman inside STEM for as long as possible but still eventually let her do her job. Keep this in mind, okay? So what behavior would be the most appropriate in this case? Keep the visibility of resistance but in the crucial moment take control of the situation. I mean, Rubik is not dumb, he kept his own family unaware of his deeds and traded with Jimenez since he was small. Just like me, I doubt they want damaged goods. Back up! He's coming with me! Oh, I hope so. I needn't remind you the consequences for failure. I... Your people aren't the only ones counting on this boy. You need him to get out. As do I. We're all their pawns, eventual victims. They killed me. They ripped me apart and took what they needed. I will destroy what they wish to control. What kind of sh is this? Why is he telling Kidman his plan now? Doesn't he want to leave STEM? As a result, Kidman is less motivated to finish her mission. Hell, now she has no reason to do this at all, except that this was an order. It looks even funnier when the false administrator shows up and demands to continue her mission. This is not acceptable behavior. You will bring us back that order. Everything Rubik had to do was to let the woman do her job. She runs away and the DLC ends. I, I don't, I don't want to judge here. We have another DLC and maybe there the game will answer questions it asked. Thank you so much for your attention. Hope you enjoyed this analysis and hope to see you next time. See you.